Hello and welcome once more to Black Magic Treehouse, the podcast where every episode is submitted for your approval. What do you think about that? I was going to say, let me predict, and that was going to be my prediction. (laughs) Well, that's a pretty safe bet to go with today's topic. And guess what? Well, first of all, let's, uh, very rude, very rude to start a podcast and not introduce ourselves. Uh, My name is Jose, and I am but one of the hosts of this podcast. Our other host is this guy over here. I am Eric. I am but two of the podcast. Yes, but number two, look him up on IMDb. (laughs) So here at Black Magic Treehouse, our purview is all the creepy things that you might have enjoyed watching, reading, listening to as a child from some bygone era. And sometimes we also hone our sights on media from more recent years. But today we are still in the hot tub time machine. We are going back to our own adolescence to discuss possibly i think eric our con- uh, our conjoined most beloved hmm. boy i am just <laughs> i uh, just power just... through it man i think it's fine <laughs> yeah it's i know I, it's just <laughs> i don't know uh okay I would say that today's topic is probably our most treasured piece of media from our childhood when it comes to creepy kid stuff. We are, of course, talking about "Are You Afraid of the Dark?" Am I am I being rude and speaking for you in that sense? Is is this your most treasured piece of media, or have I grossly overestimated your uh, your adoration of this television show? Um, I think that's pretty spot on. I don't know. I think, uh, I feel like every time we do this podcast, I always want to just, um, trash R.L. Stein, even though he's like <laughs> part of the reason that I became a horror fan. But, uh, if you're asking me, like, is, are you afraid of the dark better and usually more consistent than Goosebumps? I would say, um, yes, probably. Yeah, I think that's definitely fair. To be honest with you, it's definitely fair. And yes, poor, poor Bobby, poor, yeah, poor Bobby's world. Be on our That's, show, jovial Bob Stein. I, I know. Can't you tell that we are just the biggest fans? The way that we just mercilessly degrade you and your life life's work. Uh, yeah, call us. The thing um, is, though, he did not have a full team of right. Well. I guess there's debate about <laughs> yeah. whether or not yeah. he did, but uh, presumably he was writing one Goosebumps book every month for, you know, seven years or however long the original series went. So I don't want to give him too hard a time comparing him to a show that had like a whole team of writers and directors and kids of varying acting ability. <laughs> Yes, varying is right. That's for sure. But uh, yeah, I I wanted to, since we're, as I said, in the hot tub time machine, I wanted to contextualize the show just a little bit. Don't want to get too much into the weeds with backstories and points of origin. But I did want to ask you, as far as your personal point of origin was concerned, how, how did you come to know this show like what 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 are some of your initial memories watching this as a as a as a whippersnapper oh well i do actually have a story about that how fun you should ask oh how cool Um, that is my sister my sister's a year older than me and uh probably we were like six and seven maybe but we were staying at my grandparents house on my dad's side and there you know it was just a pretty boring suburb in illinois Uh, small town Illinois and there wasn't really a whole lot to do but there was a kid there named Tim who I'm still not sure how he was related to us because this is the only time I saw him Um, I think it was maybe one of those deals where it was like somebody's side of the family that you just never saw like my grandmother's you know, cousins on somebody else's side or something. Right. But he was a kid who was our age, and he found out that we didn't really know that much about Nickelodeon, so he took it upon himself. Like, for an entire day, we just sat in the TV room and watched 
uh, you know, like Wienerville and Clarissa explains it all. And he would just, it was more of a Tim's explains it all. Wait, <laughs> however that title would be formatted grammatically. Um, and he would just tell us about the various shows, what the secret world of Alex Max premise was. Uh, and part of mm. that was, are you afraid of the dark? And I'm pretty sure the first episode I saw was the one with uh, Frank Gorshin, where he's the, um, like the oh, okay. girl lives in the house. And then there's like a, I don't remember if it's like through the mirror, through some mechanism, she like goes back in time and meets the former resident of the house. And then Frank Gorshin shows up with a, like a long fingernail and he's like a threatening guy um, because he wants the yeah. some stone or something like that. Yeah, I think he's looking for a stone. Yeah, so we watched that. He's looking for a stone. And then later on in that same trip, maybe the next day, uh, the episode, which I think you know, that frightened me off of the show for another several years came on, which is um, The Tale of the Midnight Madness. Is that the title? Oh, yeah. With the oh, yes. Bucktooth vampire coming out of the screen. Yep, yeah, Bubba Nosferatu. So I fell in love with the show on day one, and then I got scared away from it on day two, and then probably didn't watch it for another, like, four years after that. Wow. What drew you back to it, or made you feel like you were ready? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if there was anything specific. Mm -hmm. I think I was a kid who was very interested in horror stuff, but also just too scared of it most of the time. I think it was probably just a natural progression of getting mm. older and, you know, still being fascinated by it and then eventually deciding like, okay, I'm ready. I can handle this. Do you happen to remember? <clears throat> so you said your second episode scared the bejesus out of you. And just a tangent off of that uh, briefly, that is one of my favorite episodes. I think it's kind of a fan favorite, the tale of the midnight madness from, season two uh i also have indelible memories of watching that episode as a kid i think i might have actually been at my grandparents house very very possible mm -hmm. um and it was one of those things where i was equally uh fascinated by it um because this was right around the time that i was getting into the older uh monster movies i don't think uh, i don't think that i would have seen nosferatu by that point but um in either case his uh his appearance was still familiar to me uh but i i love the concept and still do i i love the concept of the time of um fictional characters entering reality or vice versa just as a kid who was preoccupied with books and movies to the degree that i was and am you know that was always a trope that i really enjoyed uh but yeah it also scared the crap out of me um just because in that episode you you know that's like oh it's a real threat now and he comes out of the movie screen and he bites the theater manager on the neck and it's like oh my goodness shit's getting real um you know yeah it's a really nervy feeling even with the the big old you know kind of like spirit halloween redneck teeth that he's got <laughs> that he's sporting yeah. he's uh, still a really terrifying figure and uh eric and i actually did a little commentary on that episode <laughs> years and years ago stop trying to, when we, stop uh... trying to point people back towards that old thing <laughs> hey i told you we are in the hot tub time machine so we're looking at all of it including our our uh our previous attempts to do this kind of thing when we knew even less than we do now so in any case yeah let me I... ask you this jose okay go ahead go ahead have you seen Hot Tub Time Machine, or is it just a handy reference when you want to talk about time travel? Yep, just a handy reference, you know, doing the okay, millennial I was thing. Say, yeah. Given how many, like, culturally relevant movies I ask you if you've seen, and you're always like, no, <laughs> I only watch horror, I was going to give you a hard time if Hot Tub Time Machine was, like, the one non-horror movie you've seen in your entire life exactly i got the t-shirt and everything it's the one that i stand by post millennium it's just a vast wasteland with one little diamond in the rough and that diamond's name is hot tub <laughs> time machine i think it even got a sequel didn't it because it was like like kind a, of a thing like a direct-to-video sequel i think 
Uh, possibly. Yeah. With all those American Pie presents naked mile or whatever yeah seems appropriate um but the question i wanted to ask you was uh at, at what point do you recall starting to like really like the show like what um you know was there any one episode that you recall seeing back then that kind of you know that kind of did it for you it's like oh this is kind of scary but i'm also like really into it do you recall anything like that from uh, your actual childhood um well, I feel like we've already talked about Tale of the Dead Man's Float on oh, this very yeah. podcast. Yeah. But that is, if I'm ranking episodes, I think that's got to be number one. Uh, because I think it was just such a good, like, the the best kids horror is, and the best t- episodes of Are You Afraid of the Dark are the ones that can still maintain the threat without, like, you know, the buck teeth on the vampire may have been a little bit too far into conceding like this is a show for kids so we can't make it too scary but i think tale of the dead man's float really just found that perfect middle ground of like this is perfectly g-rated there's nothing overtly uh you know putrescent about it (laughs) but it's still it's a good workaround like that uh ec comics like corpse demon and with the red die and all that is like perfect imagery for children's horror yes perfect image for children we should get like a motivational poster of the ghost from (laughs) and hanging in every child's bedroom it's like you can do it yeah and then let's see but I, i was trying to think of a different episode because i feel like we've already talked about that on some other episode of uh midnight uh what what's our podcast called (laughs) Our podcast is called The Midnight Society, don't you remember? <laughs> Whatever the hell this thing is called. Black Magic Treehouse, there it is. Black Magic Treehouse, that's right. I, that's I'm like... actually trying to reach back into the recesses of my mind to recall um, what episodes made like your top 10 that you uh, you blogged about on, on your first site. Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, probably was... Tale of the Ghastly. I bet they're probably the same still. Yeah. Uh, I think Tale of the Ghastly Grinner would be on there. Uh, the tale of the tale of the the dark music is that what it's called or the where the kid in the basement has like the demon yeah that eats his sister at the end <laughs> yeah uh, oh promise uh, to yeah the tale cool. of the 109.1 or whatever the station is oh. with the dead with gilbert Gottfried. yeah yeah being sinister <laughs> um I'm sure there are others. Uh, what about you? Oh, no, that's a great, great passel of episodes. You know, the funny thing about Tale of the Dark Music was that was one that I never saw as a kid. I only saw it as an adult. Uh, I want to say, oh, I don't know, sometime in college, 19, 20 years old, I came across a, a website that was selling bootleg copies of the Are You Afraid of the Dark Seasons? Uh, so I bought them, mm-hmm. uh, like you do, because it unfortunately has not been released intact all seven seasons on region one, to my knowledge. Um, so, you know, get on that people. Come on. You can't have us resorting to these drastic methods of going to the black market. But in any case, um, that was one that my wife vividly remembered and she would tell me about. It. I'm like, wow, that sounds kind of weird. And we watched it and like, you know, I'm sure there are like, I'm sure there have been, there has been series since then, like, you know, some of the more modern ones, you have like R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour, there's that series on Netflix that I've seen like pictures of, creeped out, so I can't help but wonder, you know, we're, we're talking about like how, how horrific can you get for kids, I feel like um, that, that bar has, or I should say that envelope has been pushed far afield from where it was you know back in the 90s early 2000s when we were younger uh so i'm curious how the things we found horrific even something like the ghost from dead man's float how that stacks up to some things we you might see in a more modern series but in any case um i say that to contextualize 
that I had I had little experience with more modern series, so I didn't really know how far they would go. But seeing that episode, Tale of the Dark Music, as an adult, and you know having that attachment to it in the sense of oh, this was something that was on TV when I was a kid, so I kind of knew how far uh, a a story like this could or couldn't go it might seem pretty tame probably does seem pretty tame you know when stacked up against modern sensibilities but when i watched that you know as a 20 something year old my jaw hit the floor because i'm like oh my god they really went for it like and this was that was like episode five it was or maybe not episode five but in any case it was like very it was the first season very early on in the series like they went for it and um it's kind of funny in that episode and others i think too they they would do this there was this tendency um even as far back as uh alfred hitchcock presents you know alfred hitchcock would have his opening introduction and his closing narration usually in the closing narration for like 90 percent of those shows if there was any indication that the criminal had gotten away with it or was going to get away with it you know, he was essentially forced by the networks to pander to, you know, instilling law and order. And so the tale proper would end and he would be like, oh, well, you know, like five minutes after this story ended, they were caught. So don't worry. Yeah. Justice is served. Uh, the same thing happens in the tale of the she dark music. Because uh, it, yeah. She, uh, uh, I'm trying to make a reference here and I'm having trouble with it. Um, the one that Roald Dahl wrote where the woman like hits her husband with a frozen side of beef or a lamb chop or something. Lamb to the slaughter. Yeah. I feel like there's a, the coda on that is like that she tried it again, but then it was, it was thawed or something. So it didn't kill the person and that's how she got caught. That's right. Yeah. I think that is correct. And it's like, man, why do you got to do that? It's the story was just fine the way it is. They actually do that at, at the end of Dark Music because it ends with, you know, the demon and the and the root cellar promising our hero that he'll give him whatever he wants as long as he feeds him. And then you hear his bratty sister calling from upstairs, and then the boy just gives the camera and us, the viewer, this very knowing, you know, kind of sinister smile. And, you know, that's like something really startling. Like I said, even as a 20 something year old, I'm, I was I was like clutching my pearls. I'm like, oh, my goodness, <laughs> you know, but like uh, whoever, wh whatever his face was from the first season, the kind of obnoxious blonde kid, uh, he was the one telling that story. And somebody asked him, did he really feed his sister to the monster? And he's like, nah, he thought twice about it, but it was always kind of something he had in his back pocket. It's like, pfft. I don't know. That yeah. that smile told me something completely different. So <laughs> I don't know if I even believe what you have to say about that, even though it's your story. Uh, but anyway. I, th um, I think the obnoxious blonde kid was named Eric. If oh, I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> That's <laughs> such an obnoxious name. So it fits the character. Yeah. Good representation <laughs> for people like me. Yeah. Um, but uh, I actually... Um, I wrote a, a list not too long ago for a, a website that was like my 10 most memorable uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes. And I that that phrase memorable was like my concession, my concession to the Internet, the entire Internet that I'm not claiming these are the best episodes. <laughs> I'm just saying that there are elements about them that make them the most memorable which is, I don't know, kind of a lame thing to do because it's like, well, if they're the most memorable, then we really don't need your list to tell us they're the most memorable because we remember them. Maybe. But in any case, uh, Tale of the Ghastly Grinner made the list. Um, that's one of the episodes that I feel like was kind of, you know, certainly on the goofier side and I, I like it just fine. Um, but I do really appreciate other episodes that... Um, you know, didn't make my list um, because they weren't maybe flamboyant enough um, to be uh, memorable per se. Uh, I'll touch on those in just a moment, but just like uh, I know oh, what else I made the suspense. list was Tale of the... 
Yeah, Tale of the Night Shift, which we talked about. Yes. Um, fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> it's another episode. season five episode. That's a. Is that a. Yeah, that is a season five. I'm pretty yeah. sure. I mean, season seven. It, no, season. I don't know. It was before the reboot with Tucker leading okay. the Midnight Society for yes, sure. Because right. I think they had one called Tale of the Night Nurse. Yes. Later on, but that was a different one. Um, did you. Just real quick, did you watch the seasons? Well, first of all, Tale of the Silver Sight, I know, is one, two, and three of season seven. Mm -hmm. uh, so did they have more like regular episodes after that, or was that the whole series finale? No. Um, so, by the way, listener, uh, the actual topic of today's episode is the Tale of the Silver Sight, the three-part special that uh, headlined the seventh and final season of Are You Afraid of the Dark? So that is actually what we are in our typical Black Magic Treehouse fashion. We are gradually, eventually, organically getting to uh, as we mow through the rest of the terrain of this this beautiful show uh but yeah um based on what i remember and based on the information available on uh you know those those great valuable sources of consistent reliable information wikipedia and imdb uh tale of the silver sight was a three-parter which is uh interesting for the fact that it was aired over the span of one night so it was in three parts, and it was aired over just one night, April 2nd, 2000. So I would have been fourth grade at that time, I think, fourth grade. Um, but the rest of the season, which was only like three months worth of episodes, I think I saw, like this came out April 2nd, and then the final season's last episode aired in June. So it was... <laughs> It was more like a mini season by most standards, but it, I think it had just about the same amount of episodes as uh, all the other seasons, if I'm not mistaken. But um, yeah, it was actually like a little bit of a, a special event. And I remember actually watching this in, in real time when it debuted. Did This is your first time having seen it, though, correct? Yes, I gave up after... Um like four episodes when they brought the new cast in yeah uh, was there a gap between season five and six i feel like there was like a, a couple of been. years that they took off yeah let's take a peek see here i guess i could just be looking this up myself instead of just having you do it well you know but i just is... thought you might know off the top of your head uh, I don't actually, but let's see. I feel like you are correct. So season five. So Tale of Dead Man's Float, first episode of season five. That was in October 1995. Last episode, Tale of the Night Shift, last episode of season five, February 1996. Season six, first episode, yep, 1999. So yeah, a gap of okay. about three years there. That seems crazy. It's, it seems like it was a shorter amount of time in retrospect. I was wondering because and I, wonder I was what... thinking shows today, like it's kind of normal to just take a year or two off, like yeah. Stranger Things drop seasons, what, like every two, three years now? <laughs> but it's just like a normal thing. But like when you're a kid, I was like, do I just remember that gap as being longer than it was? Because, you know, time is so much slower when you're younger. Whereas now it's like, you know something drops and you're like i wonder when the last time they dropped one of these was oh five years ago yeah. back before you know back when my life was completely different mm -hmm. so much more peaceful but also the same yeah. yeah uh so anyway i was just wondering about that but i i stopped watching i gave it a shot mm. um and i couldn't really take to the new cast members i didn't really like most of the stories and i don't know if it's because they were objectively worse or if it was just that i was you know three years older i think all of those statements have uh some basis in fact uh close to objectionable fact um just kind of glancing through the listings for uh for season seven it does for the most part seem like it's i don't know the 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 aesthetic 
was different i think um like the actual the quality of the film so it it just had a different feel and a different look to it so that was a little jarring mm-hmm. i think there are some fairly good episodes in season seven and i do mean fairly uh Right after Silver Sight, the f- episode that came after that was The Tale of the Stone Maiden, which I feel is one that a fair amount of folks probably remember. That was kind of a neat episode. And then there's uh, The Tale of the Many Faces, which uh, that sticks out in my mind. That was kind of a, a fairly memorable episode. Kind of creepy because you had all these little uh, teen models, a part of this uh, this cult uh, led by this woman who was stealing their youth and their beauty and they like wore these blank expressionless masks so that was pretty good that was pretty solid but yeah on the whole they um they just kind of lacked the magic touch i think dj McHale, the show create uh the creator of the show and writer and director of many episodes from the previous five seasons i think he was not so involved in the last two seasons and i think that shows um not to but he was the he was the uh main force behind yeah. this three-parter right i know he at least wrote them i didn't yeah check he didn't directed. direct them uh but he did he did write uh the three parts for tale of the silver sight and um what i was gonna say uh <laughs> I'm too busy scrolling through the the season six episodes like, oh, yeah, I'm like mentally tallying them as as I'm trying to carry on the thread of the conversation. I think the the thing that sticks out to me about the last two seasons is so not only do they have that kind of different visual aesthetic to them, you know, that marks them as different. I feel like the tone of them, they seem it's it's kind of appropriate that you brought up the goosebumps comparison. I feel like the tone of them is closer to the type of thing that you would see in goosebumps than most of the episodes from the previous five seasons. The first five seasons, I feel like things were kind of more rooted in, I don't want to sound too old, you know, I don't, I don't want to sound like too old timey about this, which I guess is a weird thing to say, but I felt like things were kind of rooted more in folklore and magical realism, um, just kind of like classic horror traditions from literature and cinema. Uh, There was also this strain of adventure, which is really apparent in um, Tale of the Silver Side and a lot of the episodes that DJ McHale wrote and directed. There's kind of an interesting... um, fun fact associated with that that i had confirmed from an episode of a podcast that dj McHale was a guest on because it was just something that was bothering me i'm like he keeps referencing these episodes that he wrote but when you look up the credits you know this it says oh written you know screenplay by or written by chloe brown and i'm like what's the story there and as it has so happens it was confirmed in this podcast episode that um, I forget who he said it was, but you know, some big wig either at the network or part of the, you know, production team, you know, some producer told him, look, it's not, it's not a good look for you to have your name all over the show. So if it says, you know, created by DJ McHale, directed by DJ McHale, written by DJ McHale, it's, you know, it's, you know, you're better off just using a pseudonym and that's what he did. Uh, and I feel like in the podcast episode, he was like, in retrospect, that was dumb. Um, <laughs> but it was just, you know, what I did at the time. Yeah, Aaron Sorkin got away with it on West Wing, so yeah, right? Huh, that's interesting because Chloe Brown is a name that I always remember because, uh, so many of the, my favorite episodes. Oh, Tale of the Dangerous Soup was one of hers yes. or his, I yes. guess. Uh, that was one that was on my blog list. Um, but do you want to get back to uh, the cliffhanger you left us with where you were saying, I have some episodes I oh, want to talk yeah, yeah, about yeah. that I didn't put on my most memorable list? Well, I can't say that I'm able at present to talk about them in so much detail because it's been a good a good while since I've seen them. But, um, you know, there are a couple of the more softer episodes that are just really touching um, that, you know, not too many people 
talk about um, just because they're, like I said, they're not as exciting. They're not as flamboyant as some of the more memorable ones. Uh, and just kind of describing them in that way, I'm sure you know at least one of them that I'm referring to. And I think this one actually made your list. It's uh, The Tale of the Shiny Red Bicycle. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, just uh, really touching ones like that. Um, that one, I really, I remember because like I said, it's been a while since I've seen it. I remember really enjoying because, which is perhaps a a, a, a strange way to say, uh, to typify my, my feelings towards that episode, because it's, um, it's not a, a thrill a minute kind of story. It's more introspective. And I was kind of uh, astounded by it in a way again this was one of the episodes that i saw as an adult if i saw it as a kid you know uh during its initial airing or on reruns i don't remember it and it probably flew over my head if i did because really it's unless you have dealt spoiler alert unless you've dealt with uh the passing of a loved one or a friend that episode if you're seeing it as a kid is probably not going to resound that much with you outside of the fact that oh the ghost of his friend is talking to him Ooh, creepy and then you know you're on to the next thing you're over here back on the couch playing your game boy having totally forgotten it but seeing it as an adult you know once you've weathered a few funerals and things like that it is uh incredibly moving and it's it's doubly surprising for the fact that its main character, as in all the other episodes, is a, is a young person, is a teen who has lost this friend. And he's having these memories of when they were kids. I may be marring some of the details of this episode since it's been so long. Uh, but he's basically grieving and he cannot let the memory of his friend go. And I believe the episode ends with like this grieving teen's uh younger brother getting into an accident and that's kind of like the catalyst for him moving on from these uh you know these f uh mourning feelings for his departed friend because he he values what's in front of him he values you know the uh the emotional connections that he he has with his uh his younger brother who i think he he was like neglecting through the course of the episode just because he was so entrenched in his grief does that sound correct to you uh, yeah i think so i've seen it somewhat more recently because i we have paramount plus which has a selection oh, of cool. episodes of the first five seasons for some reason <laughs> there are some that are missing um yeah like you said That's it's fun. so strange that there's no commercial release of all the episodes because season six and seven not on paramount plus at all some of those you can buy through amazon which groups them mm -hmm. not by season but into weird volumes which like has a handful of episodes from every yeah. season it's so weird so it's, it's hard to yeah, cross reference like what could i watch through here and what could i watch through amazon that i would have to buy to fill in the gaps of what they don't have on paramount and are there episodes that both mm -hmm. of them are missing uh so anyway but yes back, back to your question uh mm -hmm. that is the gist of it but um yeah the his friend comes back as a ghost to warn him about going to save his brother because there's mm -hmm. like a bike accident and then like there's like a dam opening or whatever and he's yeah. about to his little brother's about to drown so yeah yeah um so episodes like that um i wasn't quite as emotionally taken with this other episode but um i, I think uh dj McHale talked about it at some length in that podcast episode and you know his his contextualizing of it just made me appreciate it more episodes like the tale of train magic um mm -hmm. that is just and and i think you know i'm i may be piggybacking on some of the things he said in that podcast you know i really do appreciate you know, the, what shall we say, the kind of generous, uh, hmm, I guess that's the only way I can think to put it right now. I appreciate the generous purview that DJ McHale was taking, especially with those first five seasons, where even though it was called Are You Afraid of the Dark and it had its share of spooky moments, creepy episodes, he really was approaching it 
with more of a a mind to encompass the whole fantastic spectrum in kind of a similar way to uh, Rod Serling with the Twilight Zone, where it wasn't just, you know, like werewolves and ghosts. It was also things that kind of just touched that touched on the supernatural um, or, you know, the tale of train magic. It was, it was just kind of like a wistful story um, that didn't necessarily have like a big uh, bo- bogey monster in the center of it, in the center of it. Uh, so even though, you know, that may not be like the first episode I go to when I retrieve my black market DVDs, um, it's ones like that, that make me really appreciate the show for what it was and what it was trying to do. Did you have anything, um, whether it was those episodes or along those lines, that um, did the same thing for you? Well, gee, I guess it's my turn to scroll now. (laughs) Because I think I I always mix up... Oh, this doesn't just have a... Hold on. Let me go to the list of Are You Afraid of the Dark episodes. There you go. Uh, Good old Wikipedia. Series overview. Oh, you know what? Here's my hot take for the episode. The Tale of Laughing in the Dark overrated that is a boring episode (laughs) nothing happens i can i can see that that actually did make my my list though um and and there was essentially for the reason that you know it uh and this was a time when we weren't so inundated with the whole scary clown killer clown psycho clown uh, parade, you know, it's practically a staple of the Halloween season now. Uh, but even so, I still appreciate it for the fact that it is a scary clown episode that never really shows you the scary clown, <laughs> and that may be why That's people, you know, such as yourself, don't, don't like it. It's like, well, damn it, if I'm gonna watch the scary clown episode, show me the scary clown. But I actually, I think, I think it is unsettling because you you never see Zebo in the flesh, so to speak. You only see his uh, his funhouse stand-in. Um, well, so you're incorrect. We will uh... we will agree. We will agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> the Tale of the Dream Machine is another one that was on my list. Mm. Um, you know the ones that yeah, I didn't I like that, that much were the dorky ones, because I'm seeing uh, Tale of the Dark Dragon, um, which is... Mm. Wait, is that the one that I'm thinking it is? Oh, never mind. I don't even remember that one. I wonder if yeah, that's, that's like the, the one that's not on Paramount or... Plus. Yeah. Because I don't remember that one at all. I was thinking of Probably. the one where they like go to a school mm. and then they're like hatching dragon eggs or something. Do you remember that one? <laughs> do you want to know what that episode's called? Sure. You want to know what it's called? I do. The Tale of the Hatching. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's called The Tale of the Hatching. The one about the hatching, it's oh. called Tale of the Hatching. Yeah, here it is. Sure is. Who need human <laughs> children to care for their lizard <laughs> alien offspring. Yeah, it's funny. I I was kind of a. I mean, I still am in a lot of ways. Uh, but I feel like I'm I'm much more uh, open minded these days. But as a kid, uh, and we've touched on this a little bit, I was like a strict horror purist. Um, so anything that smacked even a little bit of like science fictiony, I was like, ew, no, no, don't like it, take it away. If it was like anything that involved aliens or conspiracies or robots, I'm like, dumb, boring, you know, come on, show me, show me the monster. I want a monster from like Transylvania or under the ground. Give me something. So uh, I don't know if that was kind of along the same lines of dorky stuff that you were referring to. I thought you would maybe uh make mention of stuff like tail the pinball wizard or something like oh, that. Oh yeah. Boo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Hot takes. Um, I was going to say something and then I totally forgot. Oh, about horror purity. I'm the same way, but it's weird because when I'm watching a science fiction movie that unexpectedly mm. turns into a horror movie, I love that. But I don't like it when, yeah, horror suddenly turns into like a weird fantasy kind of thing. I'm like, mm. ew, pu, no, thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's funny how that works. Uh, so. But I found one that is 
closer to the, your original question, which is the tale of apartment 214, um, which is where oh, the, yeah. yeah, it's about the girl who like makes friend with an old, makes friends with an old lady next door. And then it turns out the old lady's a ghost. Uh, and then the old lady's getting like mad cause she's lonely. And, uh, the girl keeps forgetting to, or stuff gets in her way or whatever. And, um, you can tell from my description, I don't concretely remember what happens, but it's one of those ones that I think I would not have liked as a kid because I was like, oh, it's a sad ghost, not a scary ghost. Who cares? Thumbs down. But watching it as an adult, right. when you understand, <laughs> um, you know, becoming older and irrelevant, I think it becomes more right. uh, poignant to you. I'm like, oh. And then uh, the girl, the little girl who doesn't have, or maybe they just moved. So she doesn't have a ton of friends. And then the ghost who doesn't have friends cause she's dead. And then they find each other in this mm. crazy thing we call life and death. <laughs> this crazy thing we call, are you afraid of the dark? We'll be afraid together. Oh, what a sweet message. Should I, uh, should uh, I find more episodes to shit talk though? Cause I probably can. <laughs> that would be fun uh who, who's complaining at this point i will say about apartment 214 um you know for the shall we say the kind of uh as you used to use your word the poignant realistic underpinnings that that story has uh like you said about you know just kind of forgetting our elders neglecting them forgetting their stories uh that episode has a genuinely creepy moment when you mention you know the old lady getting mad at the girl for forgetting her that's actually a really unsettling sequence that i remember seeing as a kid and it was like ooh, because it, it's basically just an old woman an adult yelling at this girl and i think like they film it like you, you uh, there's at least uh one sustained shot where you're kind of like seeing it from the girl's perspective so the old woman is like getting up from her rocking chair and she's just coming at you you know the camera the viewer and you know basically lambasting her for how could you forget me and it's that's that i will say you know even though as a kid might not have uh, fully understood the scenario or what it was referencing that was a genuinely like oh creepy moment and all it all it was was just this actress uh wailing her heart out it's like wow who who knew i could get shook like that that's true yeah i did forget about that part that is and it, it's kind of like that moment in the sixth sense with the housewife or whatever who's like do you remember the part where there's the woman who's like yeah. yelling at is his name cole the kid uh she's yelling at him like yeah. like he's yeah. her abusive husband and she's just like it's kind of a similar type of shot where you're seeing it from his perspective and she's just like coming mm. towards him screaming and then she's like shows him her the wrist that she slashed like look what you made me do because you were so horrible to me yeah that is an effective setup i'll give you that one uh yeah. you win this round let's Jose. have let's have more adults yelling at kids <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, but speaking of let's have more adults yelling at kids in our horror media speaking of the dorky ones though real quick i will say one that i always liked even though it is a dorky one is the tale of the final wish which is about the girl who loves fairy tales and then gets mm -hmm. sucked into the world of the sandman and it's bobcat goldthwaite <laughs> uh that one is hi there <laughs> yep <laughs> wow i didn't know you had a bobcat goldthwaite impression just ready to go locked and loaded yeah <laughs> I was waiting for my moment and it came. He also made a horror movie. Did you see um, Willow Creek? I heard about it. I heard it's about it. I have not seen it now. Yeah. Hmm. Bigfoot movie, right? It is. Yeah. It's about people. Yeah. Going to where they shot the Patterson Gimli Bigfoot. And like, oh. it's like funny because they're running into all the Bigfoot weirdos, you know, all the conspiracy theorists <laughs> and all the crazy people. Um, and they're kind of like rolling their eyes at that, but then it like gradually turns into like, like there's, um, the part that I think people kind of celebrate it's found footage, like Blair Witch style, but there's like a mm. sequence where they're in a tent in the middle of the night. And then it's just like this really long sustained shot of just like, you know, something hits the tent and then they like hear a noise and they're just cowering mm. inside waiting for it to be over. Uh, it's good. It's worth watching. And it's wow. only like, you know, 80 minutes or whatever. So. Right. 
Bobcat Goldthwait, unlikely horror alley. Yeah. That can't help but put me in mind of uh, a season six. Yeah, season six episode, uh, The Tale of Bigfoot Ridge. Uh, and I mentioned that only to say that uh, in that podcast episode, do you like how I'm talking about another podcast episode on this podcast? I'm basically promoting it, and I, I'm totally forgetting which one it was. But in that interview with DJ McHale, he he referenced this episode where you know he said that there was really a drop in quality in those last two seasons. And at first, he he was not naming names, but he said, uh, you know, we had one episode where the lead actor was just so horrible. I don't understand how, like, he even got past the screen test, but it just, like, sank that episodes, and the podcast hosts were just kind of pressing him, like, okay, come on, you know, <laughs> do tell. And he finally, yeah, he finally admitted it was, yeah. It was the tale of Bigfoot Ridge starring Hayden Christensen. <laughs> Do you know what's funny about that? It's like, huh? Another podcast. Which, what's funny about that? Another podcast, which you trash, called uh, Welcome to Deadcast, also has a story <laughs> where they went to like a convention and like the producer, I think it was a producer of Goosebumps, was telling a story about how they had this one kid who kept coming in and auditioning and they were like, we can't hire this kid. He's just too bad. And then eventually they ran out of actors and they had to cast him in goosebumps and it was Hayden Christensen. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> he gets around. What episode was he in? I don't know. I, he was um, like, um, okay. he was like a snazzy photographer kid you know doing the whole like oh yeah play to the camera baby you know that kind of thing oh my god wow i've those two stories make me feel kind of bad for him <laughs> let me see well, okay I, so I think to... i think it's not fair to judge him by star wars because everybody is bad in the prequels um but he's really good <laughs> in a movie called shattered glass where he plays um a real life journalist who like got caught for making up all of his stories He's really good in that. So uh, he, you know, uh, it's possible to become talented. <laughs> so two things. One, uh, it looks like Hayden Christensen played Zane in two episodes. Uh, oh, well, because it was part one and part two. Uh, but they did. Oh, I didn't realize this was a two parter. But uh, in Goosebumps, Night of the Living Dummy 3 was a two parter. So he played Zane in those two episodes. Uh, I don't remember the the only moment from oh boy we're just like all over the map here but the only moment yeah. I remember watching uh from from that episode of Goosebumps I again indelible memories like uh my my mother's bedroom catching this in the middle of the afternoon you know who knows probably on like Fox Kids uh but and it like scared the crap it, it was like I turned the channel just as this moment came and it's at the end of the episode where um whatever whatever the, like the gangster dummy's name you know bugsy mugsy whatever <laughs> he throws slappy out the attic window and you know Sla and of course in typical 90s fashion you see slappy sliding down the roof but it's like a dwarf actor <laughs> and and dummy <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and dummy clothes, which is really unsettling, um, even more so than just the dummy himself. Like when you see him moving, you know, the actor moving in Slappy's clothes, it's like that is 10 times more frightening than anything we saw in like the two Goosebumps movies with Jack Black. You know, they cannot hold a candle to a dwarf actor in dummy clothes. Oh, my God. Um, but he's like hanging from the gutter of the house. <laughs> and he like scream well this is like the dummy now so we see him head on so it's the dummy and he screams i'm invincible wah, 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 wah. and then he gets fucking struck by lightning and he explodes <laughs> and that was like me just turning to the station in the middle of the afternoon and i'm like sitting there on the couch shell shock like what the hell did i just see <laughs> so that's the best episode of goosebumps is what you're saying yeah because I skipped all the Hayden Christensen parts and I just got Dwarf Actor exploded by lightning. <laughs> uh, 
yeah. So anyway, are you afraid of the dark? Is that what we're talking about in this episode? I'm I'm losing. I it. could say more about Hayden uh, Christensen if you want. He's coming. No. To, uh... Oh, oh, that was the second thing. That was the second thing. Was that uh, full circle yet again? You know, you completed the circuit of my are you afraid of the dark hayden christensen story with your goosebumps hayden christensen story so i'm going to complete the circuit with your shattered glass mention i was told by a, a co-worker of mine uh, back when i was at the public library he's like you're we were filming like a training video for our indoor planetarium so i was like the the on-screen talent you know showing this is how you inflate it and he's like <laughs> i he was like editing the footage and he's like your voice reminds me of somebody and i can't put my finger on it and i'm like in suspense the whole time and i'm sure you listener can tell where this is going because i kind of spoiled it and he comes back and eventually tells me hey here's a you know a youtube link this is the movie i was talking about hayden christensen and i was like instantly deflated like oh <laughs> really and he's like yeah i mean if, if the way he put it he's like man i could have just closed my eyes and it was like you know hayden christensen was in the room with me it's like please stop talking you're just depressing me uh, Did you have a- and i watched the i watched the i watched the clip i didn't watch the movie proper but i watched you know a couple clips and i'm like eh, i i guess i can kind of see it you know it's just that like that very it's like mellow meets monotone yeah (laughs) it's like i guess that's the vibe that we both give off it's like mellow tone um that's my that's my official brand uh did you have a monologue in the training video about how sand gets everywhere no i did not talk about how sand gets everywhere or like the integrity you know journalistic integrity or anything like that so missed opportunity i guess i'm sorry hayden maybe you'd like to be a guest on our show we're you know we're celebrating you the same way we celebrate rl stein welcome to our podcast hayden christensen (laughs) yeah oh poor guy i know well, I will he's say, gonna though, be in... i think he's fine because he got back yeah, exactly. he got brought back for obi-wan i think mm-hmm. and everybody's mm-hmm. posting about how much they love him and i'm like uh, i'm sure it's probably a terrible show because everything yep. uh but also um he's coming to denver fan expo next weekend which mm-hmm. i will be at and if you want a photo op with him like the normal photo op price you know, people from like the office will be like 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. people who are actually, uh, who else is going to be there? You know, people who are actually like relevant now are like maybe 150. <laughs> and then Hayden Christensen is like $250 for a photo oh, op. So God. he's wow. making bank. Making bank, or that's just, you know, the indication that uh, work is kind of trickling in these days. He's like, man, this reminds me of when I was a kid <laughs> auditioning the hell out of Are You Afraid of the Dark and Goosebumps. Man, I would cheer, oh, though, if God. they brought him back for the movie, like playing for the Goosebumps <laughs> movies, where he's just like playing an older version of his character and he sees Slappy or something. And he's like, oh, my God, it's happening again. <sighs> I, th- <sighs> I thought you were I thought you combusted <laughs> after that lightning strike. I want to watch that episode. That uh, sounds like it's that sounds like it's meant to be funny, but I'm guessing it's probably not meant to be funny. It was definitely. I mean, watching it as a kid did not strike me as funny, and it, it was like as as serious as a. Oh, I forgot what the saying was. Okay, here we go. Cancer. <laughs> oh, heart attack. Serious as a heart that attack. Was close. Yeah, cancer's pretty bad, but you know. It didn't make it didn't make the uh the okay yeah anyway <laughs> anyway should we talk about serious uh, the tale of the silver sight or do you have more general hey. thoughts about are you afraid of the dark pre uh well probably but you know it's what been already an hour and, yeah <laughs> and we haven't talked about uh the reason we're here today tale of the silver sight so Let's bring it back. Tune in next time for the thrilling conclusion on Black Magic Treehouse.